you. All right. It's nice outside all of a sudden. Thanks for being inside. It's a nice day. Um, all right. So today what we're going to talk about is uh, we'll finish talking about the performance and benchmarking uh, material that we started on Monday. Um, talk a little bit about how to use statistics and we'll talk about Amdahl's Law, which is pretty critical to understand. Really, Amdahl's Law is one of those things that maybe comes out of computer systems, but you can apply in almost any, to almost any situation. Uh, so it's, it's quite widely useful. Um, and then we'll start talking about Butler Lamson's sort of famous paper on hints for computer system design. And this is another thing that I would really encourage you to read. I mean, the setup and the way that the paper is structured is a little bit corny, but there are some really, really good, very deep lessons in this paper about how to build um, software, not just computer systems, but a variety of different types of things that you guys will probably build in the future. All right, so I checked this morning. The course valuation percentage is currently at 43. So, you know, if you haven't done the evaluation, please do it. The sooner you guys hit the targets, the quicker I release questions from the exam. Uh, so, you know, and this is very helpful feedback. Um, but yeah, please keep going. If you haven't done it, do it. Doesn't take that long, I don't think. Um, so, and and also just just make sh just to make sure you understand, I don't see these results till after grades are <laughs> released. Um, so there's no way for me to punish you, either collectively or individually, for anything you might say on this. Um, so please be honest, you know, uh, and please do the evaluation. Okay, um, we're in the process of sort of finalizing the assignment three, the third checkpoint targets. So this is the end, the end of the road. Um, one significant difference with assignment, the third part of assignment three that you guys should be aware of is that because we've started to swap, because we've started to involve the disk, the targets run a lot more slowly than they have in the past. Now, some of you guys are probably going to get frustrated by this because you've been in an iteration loop that involves running test 161, running the target, seeing what failed, and then going back and trying to fix things. And that's not a problem, but in this case, you will actually have to figure out how to use some of the test 161 features uh, like the ability to run single tests, because if you run the whole test suite, it may take 10 minutes to complete, and that may be longer than you want to wait. Same thing when you guys start submitting things to the back end. I don't see any reason why there would be big differences in, in performance on your machine and on the back end. Once you submit something for grading on the back end, you cannot resubmit until it's done. So if you want to wait for 15 minutes to find out something that you could have found out locally, probably a little bit more quickly, by all means, go ahead. But I would encourage you to look at the test 161 features and figure out how to use them. Like actually run, can I just suggest something for future reference? Before you ask a question in a forum, like run test 161 help, you know? Like that will actually answer a lot of the questions that we've seen in the forum about the tool, right? There is a help page. It is designed to be helpful. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about in the lab putting together like a, the equivalent of the can I Google that for you? Like can I run the command with dash help for you? Uh, and put it in that line somewhere. So maybe we'll just that'll be a fun little weekend project. Uh, but yeah, please explore the capabilities of the tool. There's a lot of features you guys might not be using. Use them to shorten your iteration cycle for the swapping part so you don't get frustrated. Um, all right, uh, tomorrow there is a distinguished lecture in Clemens 120 at 3.30. I would really encourage you guys to go to this. Um, you may not have gone to some of the other ones. You may have. But this particular speaker, um, so we're also going to uh, end office hours half an hour early tomorrow at 3.30 to accommodate this so the TAs can go. Um, Hari Balakrishnan has done all sorts of really important work in computer systems and networking. And what he's going to talk about tomorrow is something that's quite accessible. So a couple years ago, uh, he took a break from MIT. He's now running a company or participating in the running of a company called Cambridge Telematics. And uh, that company right now is actually releases an app that you can download and use. Um, and tomorrow you may, in addition to finding out about what they're doing, there's some very interesting sort of psychological and sociological messages that are part of this project. Uh, but you also will find out what a fantastic driver I am. Right? And then you will want me to take you places because I'm such a safe and good driver, right? which is true, actually. 
Uh, you may not get there quickly, but you will get there alive. So that's kind of the, the bonus. Um, and, and yeah, so this is a pretty, based on sort of what I've seen from this before, this is a very accessible talk. So please come, right? I think you guys will, will uh, appreciate it. It's pretty interesting stuff. Okay, uh, final announcement of shameless plug. I'm looking for UTAs for the course I'm teaching next year. It's the first year, new first year seminar. It's a class on the internet. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, we're gonna do cool stuff. We're gonna teach people really interesting things. It's stuff that you guys probably wish that you knew, wish that we had taught you earlier. Now we're gonna teach you right freshman fall. Um, so if you wanna participate, please sign up. Uh, look at that, there's even a QR code. Uh, so we know we're in the future now. Um, so if you, wanna, if you wanna like load this up on your website and scan it with your phone or something like that, does anyone use QR codes? Raise your hand if you've scanned a QR code in the past week. All right, two people. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't, I don't get it. But anyway, there's one just to show you that I'm capable of creating one. Uh, it may or may not work. Um, so, so anyway, so, so but please sign up like, you know, we're, if you're around next year, I think if you've taken this class with me and, and you did okay, you're a reasonable fit for this. Um, we're looking for people that are excited about the material. You don't have to know the material because unfortunately this class is new and so we haven't taught you this before. None of the TAs will have taken the class. Um, so please sign up uh, and, and let me know, email me if you have any questions about it. All right, any questions about the performance and benchmarking stuff we've talked about so far? So we talked a little bit about types of benchmarks. We talked about different approaches to measuring something that is not a real system. We talked about some of the challenges of measuring time. Any questions about this before we go on? Okay, uh, so now let's talk about statistics, right? So how many of you feel like you have an expert grasp of, grasp of statistics? How many, have you, how many of you have taken a course on statistics? You already took, you took a class, right? Did they teach you something in that course? No. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, okay, how many people can explain the difference between a mean and a median? How many people understand why the difference is important? Yeah. I think that I think there's probably more damage that's been done to society by the mean than anything else out there, right? I mean, the mean is a terrible, terrible number to use. Don't use means. They're usually wrong. Use a median and it will make a lot more sense, right? For example, the average income in the United States is a lot less descriptive of what this country is like than the median income, for example, right? Anyway, so if you're not feeling like you're an expert on this stuff, it might be good to review it because to some degree, and I think this is increasingly important, you know, your lives are gonna be defined by how well you can collect, interpret, and respond to data. So if you don't feel like you can do this, figure it out. Uh, do whatever you have to do, go to Coursera or something like that, um, and, and learn this stuff because it's, it's important. But a lot of you guys, including me, maybe became computer scientists because we didn't wanna do math, um, and so, Statistics always feels like math, and so it turns, sometimes turns people off, right? Um, but, it, but it's critical, right? Um, so, you know, on a good day, we, you might be able to, and, and I have all these struggles with my students and other people I work with, I have these struggles myself. You know, on a good day, maybe I can convince you to actually run an experiment a few times and compute a summary statistic over the results. Like that's, that's what computer scientists frequently feel like is A level work as far as statistics, right? I'll run the experiment twice, um, okay? Um, and maybe if I really want some extra credit, I'll put error bars on the graph, right? Now the error bars may be a little weird because I only ran the experiment twice, um, but whatever, this is kind of how we feel, like this is good, right? We're doing good here, this is like A plus, extra credit uh, sort of statistical uh, work, right? Um, unfortunately, that's not really sufficient. So let me offer a different approach uh, to, to doing these sorts of things. Whenever you run an experiment, it's very useful, and I tell my students, you know, draw, before you produce a graph, draw a picture of what you expect the graph to look like. What is this, what is this experiment, what are the results going to yield? It's a great way of testing your intuition um, and making sure that once you see the result, you understand how it compares with what you were expecting. A lot of times we have a tendency to look at data and think, oh, okay, well that makes sense, but it only makes sense because I'm seeing it. If I actually had to predict what it looked like, what I would have discovered is my prediction looks quite different than what I found, right? And that can be a problem. Um, and, you know, again, this gives you a comparison point after you actually gather some real data. Um, 
And predictions are also a great way to validate those non-real system uh, tools that we were talking about before. So if your simulator, if you run some simple experiments on a simulator and the results don't match up with your intuition at all, then it's possible you know, one of two things is wrong. You and your intuition about how the system works, which is interesting to debug, or the simulator itself, which is even more interesting because that error is going to uh, ruin all of the results that you use that simulator to collect. Okay. So beware the premature use of summary statistics. So what do I mean by this? Um, a lot of us want to, you know, it's, it's a lot easier once I've done 10 experiments to just compute an average and move on. Um, producing things that look like distributions or histograms frequently uh, require a little bit more work on a plotting level and also potentially more data. But it's really, really deceptive to converge too quickly to any of these so-called summary statistics that try to summarize an entire data set, particularly before you know what the data set looks like, right? So, for example, these two data sets, if you collected them, if this was the underlying reality of the thing you were trying to measure, these two can produce the same mean and median. And in fact, I can construct two different distributions, one that's bimodal, uh, one that's multimodal and one that's unimodal that have all of the same summary statistics from standard deviations to everything else. And so there's really no way to figure this out. Why, are, why is this difference important? Like let's say you were measuring some part of the system performance. Why are these two distributions, why is the difference between them in terms of modality so critical? Why would, you know, why would this, if, if you were able to plot this data, why would this plot lead you in a very different direction than this plot? What is the plot on the right telling you? Yeah, Jared. The What's that? Okay, so they're different, right? And and the most striking difference here is supposed to be in the modality. Does that make sense? This this distribution is all clustered around one point. This distribution contains two different it's essentially the overlay of two different distributions. One of them's clustered around this point, the other's clustered around that point. Why is this interesting from a system perspective? Let's say this was like the low time of a, of a particular web page on your server. What is this, what is this graph over here with the, the bimodal graph? What is that telling you? What's that? Okay, I'll start with that answer and try to, so I have more than one bottleneck. I have more than one thing that's going on. There are two different contributors to the page load time. So something different is happening. Let's say this is the same web page or it's the same code path, it's the same benchmark. I'm just running it over and over and over again. There are two different things that are happening within the system. I don't know what they are, but those two different things are, are potentially producing these two different distributions. Who knows what it is? That's up to you to discover. But this data is really interesting because it tells you that there's, there, again, there's something weird going on here, right? There's some point at which one benchmark, you know, when I run the same benchmark twice, one of them goes down one path and the other goes down some other path. And those two paths are potentially what is producing this distribution. So that's extremely interesting to know. If all you do is collect this data and you never plot it and look at it and compute these summary statistics, you will never learn this. And you'll be missing out on something that's really important about the underlying system. Um, so examining raw data and looking at these types of distributions is really critical. You know, don't, don't just compute a mean, it's too lazy. Or median even. Look at the data, run enough experiments so you can, you can look at data like this, and this will give you a sense of what's going on. This has actually happened uh, to real people. So, uh, you know, Margot, who did some of the work on the course, has stories about students coming to her with data, and they, they, you know, they, would, they would say, okay, I hear I did a plot, and they would have computed one number for a data set, and she would say, you know, the, the variance on that looks kind of big, right? Can I see the underlying data? And it turns out it looks like this, and there are actually two different things going on. They had no idea what was happening, right? So this is a real thing. Okay, um, outlier. So what is an outlier when I collect data? Define an outlier, colloquial definition. Yeah. Uh, goes against, like, completely the norm. 
Yeah, it's very different than the rest of your data. So let's say I run a benchmark. The first time I run it, I get 10. The second time I run it, I get 9. The third time I run it, I get 11. The fourth time I run it, I get 100. And then I keep going, and all the rest of my results are sort of clustered around 10. So that fourth result is an outlier. It's way over there. So if I plotted the distribution, you know, I'd have a bunch of data points. Like if I did this, right, I'd have a bunch of data points that are clustered here or maybe clustered like this. And then way off here in the edge of the graph, somewhere over there, is like one data point. So what happened? So what is the tempting thing to do when you come across a data point like that? What's the easiest thing to do? Yeah. Get rid of it. Just ignore it. Right? Like, ah, oh, something weird happened. You know, it must be some strange cosmic ray that came down and bounced around the room just right and hit the, you know, hit the CPU cache just right in the right place and like somehow invalidated a, a, an entry. You know? Or, oh, whoops, I must have, you know, there's all sorts of ways to explain this away. I must have run the experiment wrong. Maybe I gave it the wrong parameters, whatever. Um, and that's very, very tempting. What, what sort of, I mean, this is related to another problem that you guys have faced in this class. What does this sort of feel like? What's another time you guys have, have probably had to work on something in this class where something really unusual happened just one time, right? And it was like, uh-oh, I hope I was ready for that. What is this similar to? I suspect some of you guys have debugged some of these problems before. Sort of like what? You, you ran, you were like, I am so happy, this test works, and I ran it again, I ran it again, and then at some point, what happens? Fails, right? Some sort of weird race. So it turns out, actually, you guys, I'm sure, will be very interested to know this. Um, Scott actually found some bugs in the solution set for assignment three. Um, but he found them because we used S161 to run it. He was actually gathering some statistics about performance under various parameters. I won't bore you with the details. So he ran this overnight. He ran like 100 times. And we actually got it to crash a few times. So that's interesting. Um, David always knew there were bugs with the assignment three solution set. But it's not clear he knew where they were. Now, now we do, right? So this is kind of like race conditions. Um, and in, in a similar way, the approach is, is, is also pretty similar, right? When I have a race, I really want to know what happened. Uh, because there's something wrong. With an outlier, it's possible that you made one of those mistakes that you're trying to claim that you did. Um, and it's possible there are cases where you can remove outliers from the data set safely. But there are also cases where those outliers are really full of information. There is something very, very bad that went on. Because if you're Amazon.com and you're running your home page, and it turns out that the average load time of your home page is you know, 100 milliseconds, but the worst case load time is one minute, you probably want to know what happened in that one minute case. Because that customer is not coming back. Unless you're Amazon.com and there's nowhere else to buy anything anyway, so you have to go back. Um, but they, they will be mad. They will be sad that your web page uh, took so long to load. Um, all right, so you really need to understand outliers when you're working with data. OK. Um, any questions about the statistics part? So this was like the fourth part of our, of our very easy progression of how to approach these sorts of performance and benchmarking problems. All right. So now let's say that we've gathered the results, we've analyzed them, we have some sense of what's going on with the system. Um, now the next thing to do is clearly just improve the slowest part of the system, right? It's an obvious next step that cannot possibly be wrong, right? OK, I'm just going to go on. Um, yeah, so, so, and, and even if, so even if this were true, this is very hard to do. Because if I, so how many people think they know what is the bottleneck or what's the slowest part of their assignment three implementation? Right. How many people, if I asked you, how do you improve performance on assignment three, you'd be like, there's this thing I need to fix. Right? How many people know that? For sure. OK. Most of you guys are wrong, probably. Right. Um, and, and you're wrong for, like, for not bad reasons. It might be, I need to fix the part of the code that I wrote at 1 in the morning or 4 in the morning. Uh, I need to pick, fix the part of the code that's really dodgy and weird. And I don't really understand. That's OK. Like, cleaning up those parts of the code isn't necessarily a bad thing. But most of your intuition about performance is wrong. And that's why it's actually really important to go through this whole process, including running benchmarks, gathering data, and being objective about uh, the parts that need to be fixed. Um, 
Because again, if you, if you ask most developers, go off and improve the performance of your code and you don't force them to do this or you don't do it yourself, they've got plenty of things to work on, right? They've got a task list that's 100 things long of things they want to fix and improve, none of which are guaranteed to have any impact on performance. And some of them actually might, uh, might cause it to decrease. OK, so let's go back to the, the first assumption, right? So I'm going to improve the slowest part, OK? So let's say your code has two functions, foo and bar. Foo takes five minutes to execute. Bar executes in five seconds. So which function should you work on optimizing and why? Yeah? I mean, it would depend if foo calls bar, then you want to optimize bar to make it. OK, so that's a good point. Let's say these are independent. There's no, there's no call chain dependencies here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's part, that's part of the answer, right? Um, the, the, and there, there are two aspects to this, right? So the, so, so the one uh, that we just brought out is significance, right? Which is how much do these functions matter? If that one, you know, if uh, foo is, let's say foo is some sort of cleanup function in your, or some sort of recovery function that's used by your file system after a crash, it may never run. Or it may run so infrequently and in cases where performance doesn't matter that you just don't care. Whereas bar may be executed like every five seconds. So it's possible that about 100% of the time that your code spends is in, is in bar and a tiny, tiny percentage is in foo. So that's part of it. Um, the other thing that's also very difficult to gauge, and this is something where you have to use your intuition as a software developer, is how, <laughs> how much performance is there to be gained by improving these functions? So if the reason why foo is so slow is because it's actually really dumb, like it's using some sort of linear search or something stupid, it may be that there's actually a, a pretty big win there that you can get easily. And it may be that actually bar has been around for 10 years and every intern that this company has hired has tried to improve bar. Um, so there may just not be a lot of performance to be gained. So these are things to think about. Um, so, and, and, but the thing that you can measure here is the significance. This is something that you can measure using standard testing suites, you know, code coverage tools and stuff like that. The difficulty part, you know, there's one of the few places in this process where you actually get to apply your intuition and a little bit of uh, knowledge about the code as a software developer. Um, so here is, you know, this, and, and if, like I said before, if there are two or three things I want you to take away from this class, this is one of them, because you can, apply, you can apply Amdahl's law to every part of your life. Uh, so here is Amdahl's, how many people have heard Amdahl's law before? Okay, awesome. So you're going to hear it again, and maybe by the fourth or fifth time you've heard it, it'll actually sink in. Um, okay, so this is the most formal presentation of Amdahl's law, and it says, the impact of any effort to improve system performance is constrained by the parts of the system not targeted by the improvement. What does that mean? Someone like try to translate that into a little bit more manageable terms. Yeah. yeah. Right, so the, the point is that if, if, there's, if I have a co piece of code that takes a minute to execute and I work on a part of it that only takes a second to execute, the overall improvement can only be one second. That's the maximum. And it's unlikely that I'm going to get that one second unless the thing is doing something totally useless and I can eliminate it completely. So what Amdahl's law says is if I was thinking about this, so, so let's say that I was able to, uh, let's say that I was able to conjecture that I could achieve the following performance improvement. So now I'm raising the stakes a little bit here because not only did foo take five minutes to run, but foo is also, it's also possible to reduce the runtime of foo by four minutes. So I can reduce the runtime of foo by 80%. In contrast, maybe I spend a lot of time on bar and I can only bring it down one second. Um, so the, the improvement of foo is better, both proportionally and absolutely. I'm getting more time back, like four minutes, a lot more time, like several multiples, and I'm doing a better job proportionally if I just look at the overall runtime. So in every possible case, this looks like a winner. Um, and yeah, that, you know, that's what I would think. Of. I don't know where, where these things come from sometimes. It's nice that they're there. It sort of jolts me out of my room. Um, 
Okay, so here, but, but I can, but in any one of these cases, I think this is really important to understand, it does not matter what those statistics before were. I can always construct a case where you're doing the wrong thing if you don't understand the contribution of foo and bar to the runtime of the system. In this case, if the program spends 95% of its time running bar and only 0.1% of its time running foo, and look, okay, maybe that seems like a contrived example, but it's not really. There are certainly parts of the code that very, very rarely get touched. How many people have used a code coverage tool before when they're doing testing? Oh, please, next year, more hands up. Um, yeah, so code coverage tools, the idea is I run a bunch of tests and a code coverage tool will tell me what percentage of the code was actually touched by the tests I ran. Zach, how hard is it to get those numbers up to 100%? It's very, very hard. So it turns out that even if you run a bunch of tests, there are all these weird code paths that your code never goes down. And guess what is down those code paths? Bugs, performance problems. All, like if the code isn't hit by the test suite, it is not tested. So if your test suite only a achieves 50% coverage, there is a whole bunch of your code that you have no idea whether it works or not, like zero. Um, so that's a problem. Um, so, if, you know, assuming, so, so again, there is code that is infrequently executed, even by really, really aggressive testing suites that are trying to, to test all sorts of things that could happen, right? So maybe some of those code branches are impossible. They may be just due to conditions that will never happen in the real world. Um, although sometimes the way adversaries attack code is by creating those impossible conditions, getting code down past that's not supposed to, to be. Right? That's another way to attack software, find parts of the software that don't get used, find bugs in them that nobody caught because the test suite didn't hit them, and create the conditions necessary to lure the code down that code path, at which point I can exploit some sort of buffer overflow or something like that. All right. Um, so in this case that I just talked about, um, the speed up that I get from bar uh, is actually less than the speed up that I get from foo. Um, simply because foo is just not executed very often. Um, and so even that, again, keep in mind, four, it was four minutes, 240 seconds versus one second. So two orders of magnitude more time was saved by my improvement to foo. And I improved foo by 80%. But regardless of what those numbers look like, I can always create this case. It's also, there's also a, a, a really uh, fun sort of, uh, uh, what's the right word for it? There's a fun pathological example here, right? Because it's possible that foo is never run at all. Uh, in that case, no matter how much work you do on it, the performance of the system will never change. Uh, so that's another interesting thing to think about. Um, and like I said before, I mean, this is why when you uh, do work on certain performance problems, if you can remove one instruction, and a lot of times this is done. Everybody who's writing hand-coded assembly for courses in our department, uh, and if you're wondering why am I doing this, I'm also wondering that, um, but I will point out the fact that it is possible sometimes to use your assembly skills to actually improve performance one cycle at a time. But if you remove one, like what's a code path where I would be very happy to find a cycle? Give me an example from operating systems of a code path where I would I would, again, I would take that month vac vacation to Tahiti if I could find one cycle on what code path? What's that? VM fault. VM fault? The fault path into the VM code. Context switches? Yeah, those are all good answers. That code gets hammered. Especially the VM fault stuff. I mean, all the time. Boom, boom, boom. I'm hitting that all the time. So that stuff has probably been poured over and looked at over and over and over by the Linux people, Windows, and all those groups. Right? Just looking for, is there any way to just reorder a few instructions and get one you trim one instruction from this path. Um, all right, um, here's another way of thinking about Amdahl's law. Like, fix the thing that's hurting you. Um, other parts of the code may be ugly, other parts of the code uh, may be messy, other parts of the code may use crappy algorithms, linear searches, whatever. They may do things in a dumb way. You may know about those problems, and those problems may keep you awake at night because you're worried about the fact that, yeah, I really didn't do a very good job of implementing that particular part of this interface, but who cares? If it's not used, it doesn't matter. So find the part uh, that's contributing to the problem and fix it. Um, and, and don't worry about the rest of the stuff. 
Um, here's another unfortunate corollary to this, to Amdahl's law, which is pretty interesting. Um, the longer you work on a particular part of the system, the less likely it is that you're still working on the right problem, even if you found the right problem to begin with. So I found part of the system that was really hurting performance. I improved it. The problem is, is I improved the contribution of that particular code path to the overall system performance. Now, all these other parts of the system are rising up as the new problem to solve. So you have to make sure that this is an iterative process. Finding a problem using benchmarking, analyzing statistics, fixing it, and starting over quickly. So you don't get too locked into just sort of polishing this one particular part of your, of your program. Because, like I said, the longer you work on that part, the less likely it is that you're doing the right thing. Okay. Any questions about this at this point? Does this make sense overall? I mean, you guys will have to do this, I think, at some point in the future. You know, even if you, you know, even given the fact that computers are really fast, if you build something that's really successful, if you go to companies that, that build these big systems, um, they very quickly get to the point where it is really important for them to squeeze every ounce out of those machines that they run. Because it's expensive to run thousands of machines and data centers, you've got to cool them, you've got to keep them online. So at some point, if you can take, if you could take Facebook's workload and reduce it by like 10%, you could tell them, you can run the same, you could support the same quality of service on 10% fewer servers. I think that they would find that interesting. Um, and, and you might find it interesting. All right. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit, we'll probably continue this on Friday, about uh, this very sort of famous paper by uh, Butler and Lampson. So the, the structure of this paper is sort of interesting, right? But first I want to make a bold claim. Um, and, and I think Butler Lampson would agree with me, which is that uh, sys computer systems are actually w way more complicated than algorithms. Um, you, you can, one, I mean, one way to think about it maybe that's more fair to the algorithm people is computer systems are essentially a, co a complex interaction between hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different algorithms that do different things. Different functions, little pieces of the function that are running in various, in various algorithms. And to some degree, every function is an algorithm. Um, but because of how computer systems are written and used, you know, we're, we're not doing big O analysis here. We're not going to prove anything about the performance of a system. That's very, very difficult to do. The best thing we can hope to do is measure things and improve the slow parts. Okay? Um, so Butler Lampson sort of leads off with this. He says, designing a computer system is actually harder than designing algorithms. Why? What are the things that make designing computer systems more difficult? What are some of them? Yeah. Zach. Yeah, there's, there's more internal interfaces. There's a lot more complexity with building a real system. Zach, what were you going to say? Right, I, have some, I actually have to think about how real computers solve problems rather than just like this abstract algorithm that I can now prove things about. Yeah. Um, what Butler Lampson says is the external interface is less, pricely blah, 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 less precisely defined, more complex, and more subject to change. What is this? Like, what is the external interface? Give me an example of an external interface to a system. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, no, we're talking about a computer system here. That's computer hardware. So computer hardware has interfaces as well, and, and you're right to point that out. But, but give me an example. I mean, where do you find a lot of interesting computer interfaces, system interfaces now? Give me an example of a system interface. I mean, you guys have been and, and implemented parts of one this semester, right? Which one is that? The system call interface. That's the interface between applications and the operating system. Now, that's kind of an interesting case, right? Because to some degree, do you, do you feel like the operating system interface at this point falls into this category? Is it, less, is it not precisely defined? Is it uh, more subject to change and more complex? I mean, complex, maybe. Even you know, the Unix interface, which is, has tried to remain pretty thin, has gotten big. There's lots and lots and lots of different system calls that you have to implement in order to implement the POSIX API. That's just hard. If you wanted to build a new operating system today and you wanted to be POSIX compliant, it takes a lot of work. There's just a lot of effort that goes into doing everything that, that POSIX requires. 
OK, what about subject to change? OS interface changes a lot, changes infrequently. What do you guys think? Pretty infrequently, right? So, OK, we don't get the infrequent. We got one of the three. Uh, less precisely defined. Again, very imprecisely defined. What do you guys think? OS interface. Not really. OK, so the OS interface has one out of three here. Um, you know, it is quite precisely defined. I mean, again, POSIX has this definition. Uh, that definition does not change very often. The, the, the rate of change of the OS API is important to applications because if it changes frequently, I have to keep rewriting my application, and that's, that's, that's annoying. Um, complex, sure. So why, I mean, is this, is this idea relevant anymore? So OK, the OS interface is, is why, well, first of all, why does the OS interface not fall into more of these categories? Compared with other interfaces that we're going to talk about in a minute, the OS interface is a lot what? Yeah. Yeah, OK, that's fair, right? But, but at this point, the OS interface may not change as much. Just why? Yeah. OK, so that's true. But I think if there was a lot of value to changing the OS API, we'd still do it. But why, like, why is the OS API so stable compared with like, the API that might be uh, you know, provided by like, a new company that provides some sort of web service online? In comparison to that, the OS API is what? Yeah, that's true too. But it's old, right? At some point, once you've worked on an interface for a while, it gets old. And once it gets old, you hopefully it gets stable. Uh, you know, it gets stable, it gets well defined. So over time, we've built up lots and lots of documentation about these interfaces because they've been around for a while and they have stopped changing so often. If you went back in time to the 50s and 60s, I think you could make this argument about the OS interface. But that's not true anymore. So what interfaces does this apply to? Give me some examples of, of modern interfaces. Because again, if this doesn't apply to anything, then why are we talking about this paper? Right? Who cares? You know, there aren't any interfaces that fall into all three of these categories anymore. What, what modern interfaces do still fall into these categories? Yeah. Yeah, like every Silicon Valley company that has a REST API, like they are, they are addressing these problems. So you know the authentication service that we use this semester to give you guys access to the course tools, that has a backend API. I had to write tools against that API. I am happy that that API did not change during the semester because that would have been a pain. Um, but who knows? I mean, the company's a couple years old. They're probably free to change their APIs. Um, but it's another case where you know, the, how exactly you, these are new interfaces, right? The interface to an authentication provider. What is that? What is the right interface? How do I design it? Um, I may, because it's not clear exactly what it is and we don't have 50 years of experience with it, it may change. It's certainly complex. There's a lots of different features and functionality I might want to provide. Um, and so I would argue that this still applies to a lot of systems. In fact, most of the systems that we build whether it's an internal API that's used by the tools within a company, or whether it's an external API that's presented to the world, um, this is still true in a lot of cases. Right? So this paper is still pretty relevant. Um, whenever you guys write a piece of software, excuse me, guys. Can we? Thanks. Um, whenever you guys write a piece of software, that software will have an API, and, you will, and so you will solve this problem. At some point, if someone else starts to use it, you'll have to worry about it in a different way because then, again, then you care about someone like me who spent you know, a day writing a tool against your API once and really doesn't want it to start to fail. Maybe it is failing. I don't know. The, the scripts I wrote haven't died, so that's been good. Um, OK, so the other reason systems are more complicated, is, as someone pointed out before, is they have a lot more internal structure. So building up some of these, you know, again, think about these big web services that have APIs. There's lots of internal APIs that you don't see that are used by one part of the system to communicate with another. And, and that's something else that, that is hard to get right. Um, and then, yeah, here, right? So the measure of success is a lot less clear. When I'm designing an interface, you know, again, there's no performance notation for interfaces. 
Performance has to do with how they're used, how intuitive they are to people. Do they accomplish the things that people want them to accomplish? Um, so that's, that's a lot trickier. I can't prove that one interface to a video uh, hosting uh, uh, service is better than another. It depends on how they're adopted and what people do with them. Uh, okay. So Butler Lampson at this point in time, I think Butler Lampson could rewrite this paper and it would probably be even more awesome. But you know, he had participated in a bunch of different software projects. Um, and he, this paper is not a, you know, a research paper in that it presents novel results. He makes no claim to do that. He says these are, to some degree, sort of folk wisdom that's emerged um, during the time that he's worked on these projects. And all of the lessons in, these, in this paper are drawn from experience. Unfortunately, you know, if you read this paper, and I would encourage you to, you will find that some of the things that he brings up are a little, I mean, they're a little dated. I mean, the examples are from you know, a couple decades ago. And so it may be a little bit hard to transport yourself in time to the point where people would care about some of the software systems that people were building back then. Um, but the lessons themselves are quite good. All right. So there are three goals that uh, Butler and Lampson focuses on when you're designing systems like this. Does anyone uh, remember what they are? Does anyone know? It's a big fancy table in here that sort of organizes everything. All right. So functionality. What does functionality mean for a system? What's that? Yeah, like does the system, can the system accomplish the goals that you set out to accomplish? Right? That's reasonable. Um, speed, performance, how quickly does it accomplish those goals, or how many resources are required to accomplish those goals? Because today, sometimes the latter is more important. You know, I may be willing to sacrifice speed, which no one cares about who's using my API, for just not having to need 10x servers, which are going to cost me a lot of money. Okay? So speed, performance, overhead, you know, this is how many resources does it require? Um, fault tolerance. What does this mean? What, what does it mean for a system to be fault tolerant? I mean, what does it mean for your OS 161 kernel to be fault tolerant? There's a three word answer. Okay, yeah, more or less. I mean, it, 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 the, the, the easiest way to describe a system that's fault tolerant is it keeps working. You know, over time, it has a history of continuing to work. Um, that can be accomplished in a variety of ways. That can be accomplished through handling lots of different inputs. That can be accomplished through making sure you control the inputs that the system receives. That can be accomplished by failing and restarting really quickly, whatever. But again, the, the property of a fault tolerant system is it keeps running, it keeps working, it keeps providing the functionality that you want. Um, so those are my goals. Now there are three, now he breaks the design task into three parts when you're designing a system. Uh, the first is ensuring that the system is complete. So this is very related to functionality. This means, is the system I'm about to build, is it actually going to accomplish everything that it set out to accomplish? And if you don't do this very carefully, I mean, how many people have ever, maybe in this class, how many people have ever had the experience of writing a piece of software and realizing like maybe halfway through that there was some important um, some important goal that the software was just not going to be able to meet based on how you've designed it, right? Like this has definitely happened to me. It happened to me when I took this class. I was like, oh, I want to do copy on write. Whoops. Um, and you guys might think about, like, given your VM data structures, could you actually do copy on write? The answer for some of you is no, right? You'd have to go back and start over and redesign new data structures. And so sometimes this happens. So if copy and write was one of the things you wanted to accomplish, and you design the system in a certain way, you can get to a point where it is just impossible, and the system is no longer complete. Choosing interfaces. So again, this is something that we know we don't talk about enough as, as software developers, I think, but the interface that you're going to provide to someone who's going to use your system, what is the API going to be? Um, because there are certain cases where if you don't provide, there are certain, there, there's two things that can go wrong here, either the interface isn't complete and then it doesn't allow me to accomplish everything I want. So even if the system accomplishes it, the interface doesn't give me access to the functionality I need. Or the interface is really bad. The interface makes it hard to do things that should be easy. Um, you want interfaces that make it 
easy to do things that should be easy, and possible to do things that someone would expect to be hard. That's the goal. Um, and then finally, you know, considering different implementations. So this is uh, related to both speed and fault tolerance. How am I actually going to build the system? What are the implementation decisions I'm going to make along the way uh, that are going to ensure that the system is performant and the system keeps working? So this is his you know, um, catch-all table that unifies all of the different pieces of advice that are in this paper. You know, as a software developer, take this table, you can print it out however you want, you could print out this slide and cut it out, and I don't know, like, paste it to your laptop, right? I mean, forget like a stupid Apple sticker or something like that, or like a, the Android robot or whatever, that's not gonna help you looking at that, right? This, looking at it will actually help you because all of the, the slogans here are really good advice and if you understand what they mean, um, you will be able to write very, very good software. How many people, I mean, how many people have heard one of these sort of slogans before? Yeah, Rob, which one? Separate the normal and worst case. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? So actually, I'll, I'll just pa I just want to pause because because I have a great example for separate the worst case, and maybe that's where we'll we'll stop today. You guys can start packing up if you want to. So, anyone remember anyone remember healthcare.gov? Remember that crappy website? Yeah, um, yeah. Awesome example of how not to design a website. Um, so a friend of my, a friend of mine was working for one of the government sort of technology agencies at that point, and. So it turned out that the way that the person who came in, the, the group that came in that fixed healthcare.gov, the way they fixed it was to separate normal and worst case. No joke. So what they realized is there was this one really, really terrible piece of software in the middle of the whole system that was causing the whole thing to just suck. It was bad, it went down all the time, you'd make an API call and you never get a response. But what they realized is a lot of the people that came to the site didn't actually need that complicated piece of logic. They could be satisfied in a much simpler way. So what it started to do is if you, you know, it would ask you a few questions. I don't understand. I've never used the website, so I don't exactly understand how it works. But it would ask you a few questions. If you were the normal case, it would bypass that entirely. And it, would, it was able to offer you some of the plans that you were eligible for. If you were the worst case, what it would do is it would tell you to come back later. It would send you an email, and then it would just bang that API over and over again with your request until it got a response. So the normal case is fast. Those people just go straight through. The worst case, I make asynchronous. So I don't make you sit there waiting while the page spins. I say, by the way, I'll send you an email tomorrow when your results are ready. Go have a nice night. Right? So these things actually work in the real world. Uh, we'll talk more about them on Friday, and we'll talk about scaling Linux to many cores. See you then.